think this is a nice topic. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk on it. That kind of is overlap of our two departments, where you know solid tumors in anatomic pathology may be sent for uh, molecular testing. Um, and I think it's also an area that's made breast cancer research an exciting area to be in, while this explosion of information is slowly being digested by the field. So it's a hot topic. Um, in terms of goals and objectives, I'm going to talk about gene expression profiling and how it's impacted the classification of breast cancers and then how it's impacted um, prognostic and predictive testing in breast cancer and then talk a little about the limitations of the technology. So before I get, delve into all the uh, gene expression profiling, I think it's important to talk about what we already use in terms of traditional classifiers of breast cancers. So you can classify a breast cancer based on how it looks under the microscope or its histology. Um, what kinds of protein it expresses, either by immunohistochemistry or in, in the case of HER2 by, by fish. Um, or you can categorize things based on how you're going to treat them. You know, are these cancers that are going to respond to chemotherapy or respond to hormonal therapy? And then you also have the TNM staging system that will help you um, uh, classify pa um, patients based on outcomes. So you really want to correlate your classification scheme that you use with outcomes. So I'll go through how we currently use some of these um, systems. So there's histologic classification. And in terms of breast cancer, there's not a whole lot of options for diagnosis if you have a, a cancer in the breast. It's usually either ductal or lobular. And then there are a variety of special types that are m much less common that are associated strongly with prognosis. So tubular cancers, as shown um, in the top picture here, are associated with a very good outcome. And then micropapillary types, also um, other types like metaplastic types, are associated with a very poor outcome. So if you see that type, you kind of know what path the, the cancer is going to take. However, the majority of breast cancers are this ductal, not otherwise specified type. Um, and the outcome, based on just saying what type it is, in that case, is really not helpful, which is where Nottingham grade comes into play. And we assign a Nottingham grade um, to each cancer based on its degree of tubule formation, so how differentiated it appears, its nuclear grade, and its mitotic activity. Um, and you can see in the top field, that's a tubular cancer. It's very low grade. It's making nice tubules, almost looks like normal breast. And that's going to have an indolent behavior biologically versus the, the image on the bottom, which is a poorly differentiated cancer. It's high grade and it's going to have an aggressive behavior. And this grading system actually correlates pretty well with prognosis and outcomes. The problem is that there is some subject subjectivity to it. If you show the same cancer to multiple pathologists, they might not all put it in the same category. So there's problems with reproducibility. And then it also has this intermediate grade category. So you could be either low, intermediate, or high grade. And the intermediate grade category, oncologists don't really know what to do with. Um, if you're going to classify cancers based on their protein expression, we already do that currently. There are cancers that are hormone receptor positive and hormone receptor negative. Um, and we first started testing for estrogen receptor in, um, with the charcoal dextran method de decades ago, which has largely been replaced by immunohistochemistry, which is a nice in situ test. And so you can either have a, a strong positive hormone receptor case that's probably going to correlate with low grade histology and an indolent. Uh, biologic behavior, or you can be ERPR negative, which usually correlates with higher grade and more aggressive behavior. So those correlations are pretty good, but there are, again, there are categories in between with lower levels of expression that are a little bit more nebulous. Um, and then HER2 um, testing by either IHC or, or FISH um, can categorize uh, cancers even further in terms of ones that overexpress this gene and ones that don't. Ones that do overexpress it tend to have a much more aggressive behavior. And the protein expression actually correlates very well with the classification um, relating to therapy. So hormone therapy candidates are ones that are, have any expression, actually, of estrogen receptor. As little as 1% of cells weekly staining appear to have some tamoxifen benefit. And then you also have your HER2-targeted therapy candidates, um, So the, based on your IHC or your FISH results. So these tests actually have really strong predictive value in terms of who's going to respond to a specific therapy. But there's really no single marker that's a fantastic predictor of who's going to respond to chemotherapy. Um, the TNM-based classification uh, basically puts patients in different categories based on their, the tumor size and the lymph node status. And they're pretty good at predicting, and, and whether it's outside of the breast, um, 
for distant metastatic disease. And that correlates very well in terms of identifying high-risk patients who have you know, distant METs, who are stage four or locally advanced with stage three disease. But this lower stage, um, stage one and stage two patients, you know, up to 15% of the stage one patients actually can die of their disease. So are those truly all low risk patients? Um, so it doesn't necessarily include some of the biology related to each cancer type. Um, so the problems with our current classification system include, you know, accuracy, ensuring that, that um, we're all reproducibly calling things the same, Nottingham grade, um, and, and also with our protein expression, making sure that there's been a lot of interest more recently um, in standardizing ER and PR testing and HER2 testing to make sure that we're all doing it the same because there's actually quite a lot of inter-lab variation in this testing. Um, and another problem is that you still get intermediate risk categories. It doesn't stratify everybody into high risk and low risk. And we all know that, that cancers with similar features can have very different outcomes. So can we do better with molecular profiling using really high throughput technology, looking at lots of markers at once, you know, can we develop a better biologic classification scheme and better um, prognostic and predictive tests that will have more clinical relevance. So I thought, I know probably a lot of you know how um, microarray testing works, but just to make sure everybody's up to speed, uh, basically you uh, take your sample, your tumor sample, um, and a reference sample, and you isolate the um, RNA, and then you label differentially. So usually the, the green fluorescent probes are labeling the reference DNA, uh, reference RNA, and then the um, tumor is labeled red. You hybridize them to a microarray where each spot represents a sep separate gene, and then you use a laser scanner to excite the probes and see what the ratios basically, you know, things that are expressed um, with a re have a red signal correlate with a higher expression of that gene in the tumor relative to the um, reference versus green being under, relatively underexpressed. And this develops, this generates a whole bunch of data that needs very sophisticated uh, statistical analysis to digest it and come up with um, useful results. And the first person to actually, the first group to actually look at this in breast cancers was Chuck Peru's group in, in 2002, and he took freshly dissected tumor from 40 breast cancers and did a thousand, you know, 8,000 gene microarray and then looked for genes that um, had a transcript that varied at least four times from a median in at least three different tumor samples. Because actually, depends on where you're taking your sample. Within a tumor, you actually had a lot of gene variability. So they focused on an, an intrinsic set of 496 genes that didn't appear to vary within one tumor but varied between different, different patients' tumors. And they identified distinct subtypes based on applying hierarchical clustering on how related the uh, genes were to each other. And this is what he found. He found that uh, there were, he could classify things into four distinct subtypes. Um, a luminal subtype, which had high expression of estrogen-related um, genes, and luminal cytokeratins. That's why it's called the luminal subtype. Um, and I've drawn a little scheme of what a normal duct might look like. And the luminal cells are the ones towards the lumen. And then basal cells are the ones more towards the basal aspect of the cell. So they expressed luminal cytokeratins. And then uh, um, a, a separate group that fell out of this analysis was HER2 positive group. And then a, a basal-like group, which expressed the basal markers, for basal cytokeratins, and a normal breast-like group. And We've, you know, previously said, okay, we can classify patients according to their estrogen receptor status. The luminal type, you know, we basically already know about. The HER2 type, we already know about. Basal-like type, what is this? That uh, generated a lot of interest. And um, subsequent studies do, using similar techniques um, continued to validate these separate subtypes um, and actually further stratified them the luminal type into a type A and a type B based on weaker level of estrogen expression and higher proliferation rates in the luminal type B category versus strong in the luminal A, the HER2 category, and then again this basal-like subtype which hadn't been really uh, classified before. So the real question is do these subtypes have prognostic value or what are, we, what are we looking at here? Do they have clinical relevance? 
And in fact, they show that they, they do have a lot of relevance in terms of prognosis. So in the blue, uh, this is two separate data sets. Um, and the blue line shows the luminal type A, which appears to have a good prognosis. Luminal type B has a little bit of a less, uh, less um, robust survival. And then the basal type and the uh, HER2 positive both had a very a poor survival. So we know what these uh, look like on gene expression array. Can we actually identify that, what, what is this basal-like phenotype, and can we identify it using our traditional markers like IHC? And um, Torsten Nielsen in 2004 published a study where they actually looked at the gene expression array um, profiles of a number of cancers, took those, and did IHC markers on them. And they found that using a panel of four markers, ER, HER2, CK5, cytokeratin 5-6, which is a basal cytokeratin, and EGFR, you could be 100% specific in identifying these. Um, not 100% sensitive, so you're going to miss about a quarter of them because they have some degree of ER positivity. So you, if you're ER negative, HER2 negative, but basal cytokeratin positive and EGFR positive, you're very likely to be a basal-like subtype. But you're not going to pick them all, all up with this panel. And then moving backwards further, back to the microscope, what does the histology of this basal-like subtype um, look like? And they found that most of these, the, the vast majority of these are Nottingham grade three, high-grade cancers, and they are characterized by a syncytial-like growth pattern with pushing borders, so a big sheet of cells that are high-grade. They've got, a lot of times, they've got geographic necrosis associated with it, and you see a stromal lymphocyte um, immune response to it. Most cases are so-called triple negatives, which is ER, PR, and HER2 negative. But again, there's not 100% overlap with the basal-like type and then they um, express CK5-6. So here's an example. You can see it's just a sheet of high-grade malignant cells. There's a little bit of necrosis off here in the corner and some lymphocytes, and it's a triple negative, ERPR negative, HER2 negative, and it has a high proliferation index by KI-67. And then this is an example of a CK5-6 stain showing basal cytokeratin expression. And actually, it's really interesting, if you look Back in the literature, as early as 1987, there, was an, there were articles looking at CK5-6 as a marker of poor prognosis in breast cancer patients, in a subset of breast cancer patients. So maybe telling us something about things we already kind of knew. Um, interestingly, um, despite the poor prognosis of this type of cancer, um, it's been shown to be exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy. So. Um, when they look at neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so patients who get chemo before they get surgery, and then they look in the tissue afterwards and see if there's a complete pathologic response or not, so if there's no cancer left at the time of surgery. And the HER2 positive and the basal likes have a really high rate of having a complete pathologic response. And this seeming paradox actually I think is well explained here that, that the poor prognosis is really being driven by the patients who don't have a complete pathologic response. So if you have a complete path response, you know, you have a really excellent outcome, but if you don't, then you're, you're really driving the poor prognosis of that group. So, and then further studies looking at the basal-like subtype have um, identified that it is a little bit more heterogeneous than was initially thought. Um, a lot of them are just invasive ductal carcinomas NOS, but if you look at histologic subtypes and where they fall into the um, expression profile categories, medullary carcinomas, which look a lot like the cancer I just showed you, the high-grade sheet-like growth, they fall into this category, not surprisingly. But also adenoid cystic carcinomas, which are salivary gland-related cancers that have a good prognosis actually in the breast, fall into this category in terms of their basal cytokeratin expression, and then metaplastic carcinomas as well. So it's a little more heterogeneous than was initially thought, um, and they may not, may not all correlate with a bad prognosis. Um, in addition, there's a variable degree of expression of basal cytokeratins, and some authors have tried to correlate how much basal cytokeratin is there with outcomes. And then again, they're not uniformly ERPR negative and HER2 negative. So triple negative does not equate necessarily with the basal-like phenotype. Interestingly, if you look at women who have BRCA1 mutations, 
um, who are very likely and have a familial type of, of breast cancer inheritance, that they all, about 80% to upwards of 80%, cluster in the basal-like subtype. So there's, there's definitely something um, related to BRCA that's driving some of this subtype. And in fact, if you look at just triple negatives and basal types in general that are not in non-mutation carriers, they often have dysregulation of this pathway. And, that, and it's basically a defect in homologous DNA repair, recombination repair. And that's um, been great interest in more recent clinical trials in targeting that pathway um, in ways that uh, will target that pathway and result in essentially mitotic catastrophe and, and make that, that repair pathway even more defective. Um, so in summary, the, this basal-like subtype accounts for about 20% of cases. It's associated with a poor prognosis, but there is a subset with good chemotherapy sensitivity and a good, a good prognosis. Um, they're associated with BRCA1 dysregulation and mutations. Most are triple negative by immunohistochemistry, but it may be more of a heterogeneous group than we initially realized. And I think um, uh, a lot of uh, studies are using this triple negative category as synonymous and using that as a surrogate in terms of designing clinical trials. And um, I think it's a reasonable surrogate, but it may not be the most ideal. Um, and then there's uh, a search for better therapies to selectively target this type that, you know, is sort of a new type that is really probably just a, a variant of this triple negative type that we knew about before. So we asked our clinicians, should we, really, should we be routinely distinguishing the basal-like phenotype from just a triple negative breast cancer? Should we do basal cytokeratins and EGFR on all our, our triple negative breast cancers? And their answer was no, because we don't really have any therapies that are different for the basal-like cases versus the triple negative cases. None of them are hormone receptor candidates. None of them are HER2-targeted candidates. So they're really just treated the same until we can actually have, if there is a uh, target that's developed against specifically the basal-like, then it may be more useful. There's some uh, question about whether it may be useful in um, determining which patients might be more likely to be BRCA1 mutation carriers because of the clustering there, but that's still in a, a little bit of debate, and, and it's not clear whether it's a stronger predictive factor than other factors they use in selecting patients for the, that testing. And there's really still not a uniform definition of this type of cancer. Um, and um, I think it's important to recognize the strong association between basal-like and triple negative cancers, but that they're not an interchangeable uh, term. So what have we learned from the molecular classification of breast cancers? Well, I think we've learned that they're, they basically back our, our IHC-related um, classification scheme and our grading scheme. So the basal-like are ERPR negative, HER2 negative, and tend to be high grade. Luminal A's tend to be ER positive, HER2 negative, and lower grade, whereas the luminal B's are similar but may have some HER2 expression and weaker ER and higher proliferative rates. And then the HER2 category, I mean, these are all categories that we were identifying already. I think what it's really done is help us realize and help the oncology community realize that all breast cancers are not alike. We can't just say, you know, everybody who walks in the door with breast cancer is going to have the same outcome just based on their stage. And that it, it, it's um, helped refocus the community in clinical trials and research um, that, you know, may target specific subtypes of cancers based on their, their um, various features. And that some of the subtypes do have the subtypes do have overlap, and I think the message here is that we've actually been doing pretty well with our traditional classifiers, and the, the gene expression rate data has really backed that. Um, we've got a large group of cancers that are ER positive, a smaller group that are ER negative, and the ones that are also HER2 her negative and low grade, low proliferation. Those are our luminal A's, and then our, our ER positive HER2. Um, uh, sorry, HER2 negative and, and maybe higher grade really correlate well with the luminal Bs. And our HER2 positives correlate with the HER2 positive. You know, the message is basically we're doing pretty well with our, our traditional classification. 
but it's helped it, with our traditional um, workup of breast cancers, but it's helped to think about a more biologically and clinical, re clinically relevant classification scheme um, that will help oncologists decide, okay, these are the types that are sensitive to chemo because they have high proliferative rates. And these are the, we, we already knew that these are the type that hormone receptor positive ones respond to hormonal therapy and, and then HER2 for HER2 targeted therapy. So what's the status of um, using these gene expression profiles to classify breast cancers? I think it's really confirmed the use of our traditional classifiers based on HER2 uh, ER and grade and histologic type, and it's not really useful as a test per se, um, but it's refocused um, research on different biologic subtypes, and I think it will help in the long run in terms of identifying more specific biologic targets. So then let's turn to gene expression arrays used um, as a test to predict prognosis and, and predict response to therapy. And I think really, you know, they're ask, we're, we're being asked to be fortune tellers here, right? And we're never going to be 100% predictive of anything because we're really only comparing things to uh, statistics. Um, and you don't, you know, we talk about the era of individualized medicine and how, how great we are at predicting individual patients' prognosis and response to therapy, but we're really just comparing their cancer to someone else's who had a similar profile. So just to recap our histologic features that we already use for prognostic and predictive information, it'd be nice if we could just look at the slide and it would tell us. But unfortunately, it doesn't. Again, we use Nottingham grade, which helps us predict response to chemotherapy if it's higher grade. We use margin status to see if it might recur, predict recurrence. And importantly, we use lymph node status it's as, as a great predictor of outcome. Um, and we give lymph, usually lymph node positive patients get chemotherapy. But one of the big questions is which lymph node negative cases are going to need chemotherapy. And that's one area that these tests have really focused on. Uh, we already talked about protein expression, but in terms of prog uh, predictive um, value, it predicts response to hormone therapy or HER2-targeted ther therapy. And actually, HER2 expression can actually predict which chemotherapy regimen you're going to get, which one you're going to be more responsive to. And anthracycline-based, more aggressive therapies tend to be given to the HER2-positive patients because they don't respond as well to CMF or, or other um, more traditional chemotherapies in breast cancer. Okay. So can we combine these traditional classifiers? When, we, when, when an uh, oncologist is trying to decide who should get chemotherapy, what do they use? They use our classifiers we just talked about, but they have a number of um, calculators um, and risk stratifiers that they can use to calculate who is going to benefit from chemotherapy. And one of the most frequently used ones is adjuvant online. Um, where you can go to this, use this online tool and type in a patient's age, their comorbidities, their ER status, grade, size, and nodal status, and get, uh, get a nice chart showing you the benefit of chemotherapy or hormonal therapy in a particular patient. So this is a patient here who's relatively young. She's ER negative, uh, high grade. She's um, got a large tumor with, with nodes involved. Uh, this 35% of women without any additional therapy at all um, are going to be alive after 10 years. Hormone therapy is not going to benefit her much because she's hormone receptor negative. But if you give her chemotherapy, an additional 28% of these patients, you know, it's a substantial benefit. And so there, in this situation, it's clear that chemotherapy is going to benefit a patient. But the benefit of chemotherapy is not always high, and it's often more nebulous. And more commonly, you have a patient who's, you know, uh, in her 50s or 60s, her health's generally good. Um, she's ER positive and an intermediate grade. Her tumor is between one and two centimeters. It's not huge. Her nodes aren't involved. No additional therapy. 84% of women are alive after 10 years. Give her hormone therapy, two more percent. So very actually small benefit for a therapy that everybody is offered. Um, and then chemotherapy, a 3% benefit after 10 years. Um, so in cases like this and, and others, a lot of those patients actually are treated with chemotherapy. And so we're really over-treating a lot of patients. And some of these tests are designed to try and identify patients we can definitely avoid chemotherapy in. Uh, the St. Galen criteria are another clinical classifier used 
um, to stratify patients into low risk, high risk, and then again, problematic to have an intermediate risk category because do those patients benefit from chemotherapy or not? So can we do better with gene expression profiling to predict response to therapy? <coughs> And when we're asking this question, the groups have had a number of different strategies for looking at the development of a gene expression signature. Using microarrays, you, microarrays, you can use a, either a top-down approach where you basically just look at the gene expression and then look at the outcomes and see which genes are associated with the good and which are associated with the bad, so the top-down approach. And then the bottom-up approach is using a biologic hypothesis, so something like let's look at uh, genes associated with invasion and then see if any of those correlate with outcome. And then lastly, the RT-PCR can be used if you have specific candidate genes you want to target and you know based on a literature review or, or biologic hypothesis that these are good targets and then correlate them with outcome. And importantly, and, and Colin Pritchard gave a nice uh, grand rounds recently on how to validate these, you know, he touched on the topic of validation of gene expression array data. And I think it's something that um, with the initial explosion and excitement about all the gene expression arrays was really uh, brought a taste of reality to all the information that you need to have a really nice clean, a nice large training set where you've trained your data on and then a separate large validation set where you're um, validating the, the markers that you selected initially. And the problem is you, you have a high risk of data overfitting if you have a small initial training set because you're only looking at one population of cancers and you need to prove that you're reproducible in multiple validation sets that are larger and are independent of that initial training set. So the first people to do this really were, were uh, the developers of what's called the Amsterdam signature. They used the top-down approach, so looked at um, all the, the gene expression and then correlated with outcome in 78 patients who were under 55 and lymph node negative and not treated with anything, no hormone therapy, no chemotherapy. And they found 70 genes that uh, were associated with either a good prognosis or a higher risk of metastasis later. And it so had a good signature and a poor signature. And they validated that um, they published their validation study in the New England Journal of Medicine um, showing a really nice oh, look. The, the, the good signature predicts a really good outcome, and the poor signature really ni uh, nicely predicts poor outcome. <coughs> However, their validation study has been brought into question some just because they were patients from the same institution, first of all, and then there was some overlap, actually, with the test set. And then this validation group was also a mixed group some were, half were lymph node positive, half were lymph node negative. Some were treated with chemo, some weren't. It was kind of a mixed bag. And in fact, when you looked at their lymph node positive patients, it wasn't actually as robust of a uh, signature in terms of predicting outcome. So it really looked like in the, ER, in the uh, lymph node negative patients, it may have some benefit, but the validation studies weren't that strong. They did compare them to the St. Galen profile to predict the clinical um, predictor of outcome and the NIH predictor of outcome. So in patients that were by those ca clinical classifiers considered high risk, the signature actually um, identified patients who had a good signature and a, and a good outcome. So possibly people who could be spared chemotherapy versus just using the clinical, um, clinical calculations. Um, and if you look at the same data, the, the poor signature was strongly associated with age and grade and ER status, so things that we already do. Um, this is now being marketed as Mammaprint, and it's available in the U.S. It was recently FDA approved um, for use in the U.S. It's widely used, actually, in Europe, um, and it... This is a report that shows your result is basically your low risk or your high risk, so it's nice stratification, it's appealing, you're not in an intermediate category ever. Um, and then they have a, a picture, which I don't have included here, where they show you the frozen section of your tumor, show you that well, this is invasion, so this is done on fresh tissue. So, you know, there's all the problems, and I'll talk a little bit more about that with sending fresh tissue in terms of being sure you're in the invasive cancer. Um, so uh, the issues with, with uh, this signature um, are, number one, fresh tissue is required, and then it, it was 
it's really only useful in the ER positive lymph node negative group, um, which is a group that, that has uh, dubious chemotherapy benefit. Um, and what's nice about it is, again, the separation into low risk and high risk group without an intermediate group, but the validation studies, again, are considered still uh, not to be as robust as they could be. However, there's a, a big prospective trial going in Europe called the MindAC trial where they're looking, they're randomizing patients to chemotherapy or not chemotherapy when they have a discordant score by a clinical uh, high risk versus the mammoprint low risk. So those patients and vice versa, those patients will get randomized. So, but that'll be several years really until we have much of a result there. The Rotterdam group um, also developed a gene expression profile to predict METs in uh, lymph node negative breast cancer patients, so similar. They used a different platform than the um, Amsterdam group and found 60 genes that were predictive of outcome in ER positive patients. They subsequently validated it in 180 lymph node negative untreated patients, so good validation. Um, and then uh, they had a, a profile, a smaller profile, that was predictive in ER negative patients, but they really couldn't validate it. So again, it seems like this ER positive group is really the only one we're going to have much of a predictive benefit in. Interestingly, only three of the genes in this signature overlap with the Amsterdam signature. So that sort of threw up everybody into disarray. How can these be valid? They don't overlap at all. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that... Um, can be possible. Um, and this, this signature is not commercially available currently. And then um, I'll just touch briefly on the, the biologic hypothesis or the bottom-up approach to this kind of testing. So people have looked at wound response signatures because it's clear that the, the um, microenvironment basically of a cancer um, and whether it can invade further and metastasize may have something to do with stromal interactions. So there's a wound response signature people have looked at that seems predictive of outcome. There's an invasiveness gene signature that seems predictive. And there's an immune response signature. So people are really branching out into different areas. Um, and then interestingly, there's a genomic grading signature. So if you take cancers that of all grades, low, intermediate, high, and then you do um, this genomic grading, none of them fall in the intermediate category. They're either low or high. And that's really nice because you've taken, taken away that intermediate risk category. Um, but these are all still, um, I think, uh, haven't been validated enough and aren't. I think there is a genomic grading signature that is available um, commercially, but it, it's not in wide use. Um, biggest problem with all of these microarray-based tests is, again, fresh tissue. You need to know in advance that you're going to send the test if the patient's going to possibly be a candidate for neoadjuvant therapy, you would have had to send it on the, the, the needle core biopsy, which gets put in formalin right away. Um, and you need to be sure you're sending the area of invasive cancer. And, you know, they, they apparently do do frozen section, but, you know, this is an example of a case that's mostly DCIS with small areas of invasion, and those won't be easily uh, micro-dissected and tested. And interestingly, in the one prospective study, um, with early results, the raster study on, on the 70 gene signature, a third of the eligible patients had to be excluded because of sampling error. So it's a big problem to work with fresh tissue, unfortunately. It's a tiny little sample. I've seen the mammoprint uh, harvester, and it's the size of a pin of a, a head of a pen. So along came genomic health, and they really took the opportunity to look at all of the data that's out there and say, all right, we need to develop something that's tar we can target specific genes and develop um, a way to do this in formal and fixed tissue. And this is a, a paraffin block here. This is how most of our cancers um, in pathology come after we've fixed them <laughs> and use RT-PCR to amplify them. And so this was their, uh, their, their validation and their development. First, they figured out a way to um, do the RT-PCR from paraffin-based blocks. And, um, what they found was that although RNA gets really degraded with formalin fixation, the relative ratios of them still um, may stay the same. So they get chewed up, but they're still the similar amounts. Um, and so they developed how to, how to actually do the RT-PCR. And then they looked, they had 250 genes that they thought in the literature looked like good candidates, 
And then they used a, a clinical trial that had already taken place and kind of retrospectively went back and tested um, those and saw, saw if they could predict outcome. And the, the patient population were ER positive, lymph node negative patients who were receiving tamoxifen but not receiving chemotherapy. So they were getting hormone therapy in contrast to previous uh, gene expression arrays like mammoprint. Um, they found 21 genes that they seemed to uh, be a good area to focus on. And then they validated those, that 21 gene assay in two subsequent um, large sets. So the, the NSABP14 trial, another prospective trial, they went back retrospectively to look at outcomes. And then in um, uh, Kaiser Permanente, so multiple hospitals in Northern California that had good registrars, registries of outcome. Um, so they could validate that. So the, actually pretty good validation studies on this, in this test. Um, there was no overlap. And this is, these are the genes that they look at in their recurrence score. Um, a lot of them you'll notice are proliferation-based, proliferation-related markers, estrogen-related markers, HER2, so things we already do. We do ER, PR, and HER2, and uh, here we do KI67 as our proliferation marker by IHC. A couple invasion-related genes and then a, a few mixed bag kind of genes. And then it's actually only a 16 cancer-related genes. Um, five of them are reference genes. And then they, they weight the uh, relative expression levels of those um, using, a, score, using um, a, a calculation here that's complicated so we can't do it ourselves. And um, you can see that it's heavily weighted for this proliferation group score. Um, and they, they come up with a recurrence score that will put you in a low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk of recurrence. And uh, in their same validation study, they showed that the low risk of recurrence um, had, a, had a nice 6.8 cent per, um, had recurrence at 10 years, so nice and low. And then the high risk had a 30% risk of recurrence. But this intermediate group, again, we're, we've got an intermediate category here, which is not that useful for clinicians. Um, and it, the uh, classification of things into low, intermediate, and high was actually a bit arbitrary, so you, as you can see, it's a continuous variable, so there are no strict cutoffs really here. Um, and then looking at recurrent, they looked at recurrence score versus age and size of tumor and said it was a better predictor of outcome versus each of those alone. But it wasn't really better than grade, um, poorly differentiated, uh, so high grade tumors were very predictive of outcome. So it's unclear whether you know, our, a combination of all our traditional factors is actually better than this test. What really sold the oncologists was this study, where they looked at um, the ability of this test to predict response to chemotherapy. Because predicting prognosis is one thing, but if you can tell me that this patient's going to respond to chemo and this one's not going to benefit at all, that's of, of high value. Um, so they, they looked at one of the prospective trials, again, retrospectively, um, to patients that received tamoxifen plus or minus chemotherapy. And overall, there was you know, a, maybe a 4 or 5% benefit. So that the blue line is when they had chemotherapy added. And then the dotted line is without chemotherapy. Overall, looking at all comers, a pretty small benefit from chemotherapy. If you look at the low risk, low recurrent score uh, category, very negligible benefit at all. Uh, intermediate risk, a little more nebulous, but look at the high risk. They really had a nice stratification. So oncologists have used this to make clinical decisions, actually, and try to identify patients that are low risk and definitely aren't going to benefit from chemotherapy um, versus high risk. But again, you've got an intermediate risk category. And one of the problems is actually that a lot of the patients have intermediate risk variables to begin with, and they get this test, and they have more. In, they fall into the intermediate risk category. This is what an Oncotype DX report looks like. It's very nice. You get a recurrence score shown here, and then a actual percent of patients who were in that clinical validation study that had recurrence. So patients like it a lot. It's got a, a nice percent survival rate there for you. And then you can graph yourself on this 
uh, these, these graphs and say, um, I have a low benefit of chemotherapy or a high benefit um, based on this um, graph here. And this is all included in your report. So you can really kind of see where you fall. But it, the, the cost is not cheap. So this is $3,500. Insurance is starting to cover it but um, not in every case. And again, a lot of patients do fall into the intermediate risk category, and so you, you may be paying a lot for a test that doesn't necessarily help you. Have we found it useful? We've been doing Oncotypes since 2006, uh, end of 2006, and um, you know, there are situations where I think it's useful maybe, but uh, especially it's not useful if the patient's already decided, I want chemotherapy, I don't care what you tell me, or I don't want chemotherapy, I don't care what you tell me. So they're not good candidates to spend $3,000 for this test. But they've marketed this heavily, and patients are actually coming in, you know, to their oncologist and asking for it. They, they've advertised in Vogue magazine. Um, um, and as I mentioned before, in patients that have other features that are indeterminate, they often get indeterminate results by this test. So I think it's really used as a supplement to current classifiers. Our, our, our oncologists pretty routinely order this test now. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that it's not without um, you know, false positive results or false negative results, potentially. Um, if you have an area of dense inflammation or biopsy site changes where you've got a lot of proliferation that's not related to the cancer, you can have false positive results. We, there was a recent poster last week at the United States, uh, USCAP, on biopsy site changes causing false positives. And then you can have contamination of, you know, if it's predominantly DCIS, you may end up in a falsely lower risk category. Um, in an effort to t try and tease out um, this intermediate risk group um, to see who would benefit from chemotherapy, <clears throat> a large prospective trial is underway called the Taylor X trial to determine if they can further stratify that intermediate risk group into, into high and low. Again, that'll be several years until it's, um, the results are available. So in summary, Oncotype DX, it's a high cost, but you can do it in formal and fixed tissue. They do have really strong validation studies. It's currently actually recommended by NCCN and ASCO in their guidelines in lymph node negative ER positive patients that have a, a certain size and, and, uh, of cancer. But you often get an intermediate risk result. The prospective trial is underway to try and tease that out more. And I think it's really still not, not perfectly clear if, you know, combining all of the biologic and, and the traditional classifiers um, will be superior to, uh, to on will it be, will Oncotype be superior to that? Um, I think there are rare cases where you can get a high recurrence score or a low recurrence score where we haven't done a good job classifying it. But I think, and I think the other thing that it does is it takes away some of the subjectivity of, you know, if a pathologist has graded something that not everybody would have called the same grade, it takes away some of the, the reproducibility problems with grading. So there are so many signatures. Which one is best? Um, and they, this uh, group actually asked that very question and took breast cancers and tried out five different profiles on them to see if they had the same prediction. And they found that actually they all classified the tumors as the same higher or low risk, um, which was surprising because they really don't have that much overlap in terms of their genes involved. Um, and they also um, noticed that proliferation genes are really the common driving force for all of these signatures. Um, and so basically, you're just taking, these profiles are just taking different snapshots of the same tumor, but you're getting the same uh, result. These are all elm trees. So how do we bring it all together? And this is a, a really nice review article if anybody's interested in reading more on this topic that was just published last month in the New England Journal um, on gene expression signatures and how we're using them in breast cancer. And um, I thought it, this was a nice diagram that showed how you can combine the molecular classification scheme and then the gene, gene expression prognostic signatures to show you know, biologically, it's differentiation and proliferation that matter. Um, and well-differentiated, low-proliferation cancers are going to have a good prognosis, and the poorly differentiated, high-proliferation cancers have a worse outcome and possibly more responsive to chemotherapies. 
Um, again, in summary, the limitations of gene expression profiling, I think um, we've gone through many of these, but frozen tissue is required in a lot of them. Data overfitting can limit the re reproducibility of some of them. Um, it's difficult to know which of the signatures to trust. And I think that um, we're still really digesting this. Um, and again, it may not give clinically helpful results for, for a high cost. Um, and, and one of the inherent limitations is really that they're not considering the host environment. None of the tests we do really do that. Um, so drug metabolism, you know, how robust their immune system is, all these things go into fighting a, a cancer. And I think one of the systems that is really going to prove to be the, one of the best tests is really the neoadjuvant response. And there are a lot of trials that are now designed around how, uh, you know, testing a different drug and um, before surgery and seeing what the tumor, how the tumor responds, because then you're taking, it's a really, it's an in vitro test. Are they ready for clinical use? I think there definitely are some that are being used already clinically, like Oncotype DX and Mammaprint. Um, I think as long as we're defining which patients they're most useful in, like the ER positive lymph node negative patients, and using it really as a supplement to existing clinical and pathologic factors, because I don't think it's necessarily superior to any of them, um, that it can be used as an adjunct. Um, and I think what really the gene expression profiling has done is it's helped us refine our whole classification scheme and our way of thinking about uh, breast cancers, understanding their biology, and hopefully to improve management and targeted therapy. And last week I went to a lecture by Stu Schnitt in Boston, and he was talking about these signatures. You know, they're everywhere in the literature, and they're, you know, they're in the breast cancer literature. They're starting to expand to other organ systems, and they're starting to just become part of everyday life. If you look around, you can see this is the poor prognosis signature in breast cancer, and this is the poor prognosis signature in the economy. So that's all I've got. In, in your personal experience with the Oncotype DX, um, I was wondering if you could comment on the frequency of positive versus negative results, or high risk versus low risk results on that, because I've heard anecdotally that positive, like high risk cases are probably less common than they said that they were in the studies, more, more that, and that focusing more on the question of cost, like how frequently, how many tests you actually have to do to get some, an answer that would make you change. Right, yeah, so we have, in our in our hands, I think we've seen only, uh, it's under 10 cases that were actually high risk in, in two and a half years. So it's a pretty low percent that had a high recurrence score. Um, a lot do fall into the low risk category, which, you know, I guess is useful for clinicians because they can say, oh, this patient definitely can be spared the chemotherapy. But <laughs> I'd say the majority, vast majority fall into the intermediate risk group, which isn't helpful. Uh, great talk, uh, uh, very nice. Um, just to sort of relate to that, I mean, if you uh, sort of look at the whole universe of breast cancer and then just try to estimate what percentage of patients is Oncotype DX really appropriate for, in other words, you know, appropriate uh, criteria and that, it, and that it, they're not going to be indeterminate and so on and so forth. So, how, you know, how would you estimate that? Uh, in terms of which ones? could avoid getting an intermediate result? Well, I, no, I mean, just how many, of, of, all, of all breast cancer patients, how many people do you think should get on the DX, roughly speaking? Right, well, I think right now, a lot of patients are getting it because the majority of patients are actually ER positive lymph node negative, because we're picking up cancers earlier and earlier now, and a lot of them are these low grade, you know, lower grade cancers. So this test is ordered a lot, and, you know, I think the Taylor X trial will hopefully give some more stratification so that you don't have this big intermediate risk category because it's an expensive test that really, you know, in the in the grand scheme of things, a lot of women still end up there. And and you can often predict who is going to end up low risk, you know, if it's a really low grade, low your your mitotic counts low, your KI 67's low, it's well differentiated, it's going to be in the low risk category. And, you know, it's, it's rare that I've been surprised by a result. <coughs> Sorry. Is there any hope that any of these markers can be developed as a serological marker to attract recurrence? 
Well, I think people are doing that, and, and they're looking at minimal residual disease, like Dan Sabbath, and um, certainly I think that's a, an application that people are very interested in. Absolutely. I'm wondering if you've come across any efforts to construct classifiers using both gene expression profiling and the patient's inherited um, genetic background. So, for example, gene expression profile plus BRCA1 or 2 status or LA type or some other combination mm. of alleles or, or mutations or polymorphisms. I haven't seen that so much. I mean, the patients who are BRCA positive, you know, they tend to all be these high risk ca uh, cancers anyway. So it tends to be more useful in the, in the lower risk population that are non mutation carriers. You know, so they're, they're a pretty well studied group, the familial group. So most of those patients end up getting chemotherapy, I think, unless they're really localized. Uh, our president, Obama, he's talking about a lot about utilization management. So I was wondering if you were named to the Breast Cancer Committee, would you recommend now that Medicare and Medicaid cover Oncotype DX, or would you tell them to wait? Um, because you know the hope is that utilization management can control Medicare and Medicaid costs. Right. So I was wondering, would you recommend it now <laughs> well, for him to cover? Well, that's a good question. And there, there, there have been some cost analysis studies that argued that you know, you're saving a certain percentage of patients' chemotherapy because they get the low risk, low recurrence score, and the cost of chemotherapy is X, and it actually, you save money if you do this test in everybody. But that's only if but it adds to what you normally do. Exactly. That, I think that, you, you know, this intermediate risk category really makes that, uh, so I, I wouldn't recommend it. I think we need to further define who should get testing, and, and, also, really, they need to have better stratification of risk. I mean, you could predict who's going to be high risk. I'm not positive that it, it, it benefits, but oncologists are using it as a piece of information to add to what they have based on what we give them usually. Quick follow up. The Oncotype DX also now reports out quantitative scores for HER2, ER, and PR, yes. mRNA. Do you, or to your knowledge, oncologists, do anything with that information? Good question. So that's correct. So um, they do do, when they um, have a case that's, say, weekly ER positive and they want to put them in a triple negative category or they want to give them hormone therapy, they use that as an extra piece of information. They don't uh, necessarily trust it over what we've done by IHC. Um, and most of the cases that I've seen come through have correlated really well. It's rare to see a discordance. I think in HER2 it may be important, potentially even more than ER, because of the cost of that therapy, and um, they want and, and they want to give people that therapy, you know, because usually those are aggressive cancers. On their HER2 score, they still have an intermediate range, though, right? They do. It's a, it's yeah, and they they validated it, the HER2 based on you know IHC and FISH, so it's validated against what we already do as the gold standard. So yeah. Mark. It's been a very nice talk again. Thank you for this rational for those of us who don't understand this area. What about recurrent disease? Does, do the signatures in the primary uh, look like those in recurrent and metastatic? Oh, that's a great stuff? question, and I'm not positive that that's been, been I, I don't know, I haven't looked into those studies, and I'm not even sure they exist, looking at if the, the recurrence is, the signature is the same. True. Right? Yeah. I think, you know, looking at the lymph node positive data, may reflect that you know it's not as predictive in in the metastatic disease so yeah it may give us false good scores well, I recall from like the earlier like the earlier microarray data and correct me if i'm wrong but i think in the earlier studies if they compare a patient's like primary tumor with say a metastatic tumor those are much more closely related by their gene expression profile as opposed to two primary tumors in two different patients with the same histology, so whether that's relevant or not, I don't know. Right. <clears throat> Thinking they're proliferating, they lose control. Right. I mean, I think just... what may end up evolving is that stage, you know, how far a cancer has traveled outside of the breast may not really be that relevant in certain types. So, you know, the high-grade aggressive ones, they're either going to respond to chemo or they're not. It's the low-grade ones that 
it's going to matter how far it's gotten out of the breast because really you're only going to carve it out and maybe give them hormonal therapy that, you know, doesn't have a, a huge benefit actually. So, you know, I think it will be different and the metastatic profiles will be different in different, um, it'll match the biology really. I mean. This a, what's a typical breast cancer workup from an anatomic pathology perspective cost? Like, you know, you're billing mm -hmm. usually CPP code 88305, which is like a, a little more than 100 bucks from Medicare. Do you, do you get like five of those in one case or one? Or is it typically so the, the billing, like on a core needle biopsy where we're doing the prognostic markers, yeah. the ERP or HER2, and I think it's around 1,500. Susie, do you know the exact? It's, it's about, it's about 1,500. Because each antibody is 150, right. and then plus a so theoretically, professional this fee. Could add 3,500 to that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then my, my, an important related question is, what is the concordance rate between two, say, breast pathology experts in that workup? Is it pretty high? Um, in terms of. Would they come up with the same answer? <laughs> right. So it's it's high for certain things and I mean that's one of the problems and why people are turning towards these kinds of assays is they think they're taking away the subjectivity. Um, grade is one of the um, least reproducible um, and if you show case to um, so-called experts in breast pathology they tend to have higher grade than community-based uh, practice so you know, it's not consistently applied. And I think that's one area, you know, we're, we're being pressured to have more standardization in immunohistochemistry, and we're also being pressured to have more standardization in terms of, you know, how we're actually doing, using this Nottingham grading and really applying the criteria appropriately. Um, and, you know, people are, uh, the community is really encouraging second opinions more and things like that to try and decrease that variability. But, yeah. So it is useful as a, you know, a check on that kind of variability. It's expensive. But it's an expensive yeah. check, and you could also just have a second opinion. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? Thank you. Maybe Kim will stick around if there's other questions. Thanks.